Hello, wonderful people. Welcome back to my channel, The Teacher's Best Friend. This is Mary Lou Areno, and I hope you're all doing well. So in today's episode, I am going to present to you about students' behavior management. And this is also a request of most teachers, because as you all know, the most challenging part of being a teacher is managing behavior, or especially managing behavior problem in the classroom. So most of the concepts that I am discussing for this episode are adapted from the book uh, First Days of School, written by Harry Wong and Rosemary Wong. So in early 1990s, uh, Harry Wong published uh, the first edition of the first 100 days of school. And since then, I became an avid fan of Harry Wong with regard to classroom management skills and strategies. So this current book that I am reading is now the fifth edition and uh, it is co-authored by uh, Rosemary Wong. So are you ready? So if you have a chance, you can grab the book and it's really helpful for all teachers. So what is the concept of an effective teacher with regard to behavior management? First, we need to think that teacher to become effective in behavior management must be proactive. It's like before the problem occur or before the behavior problem occur, the teacher must anticipate that it is going to happen and uh, already finding solution before it even happens. So that is being proactive. And uh, another uh, concept is the teacher must have management plan that includes the classroom management procedure or instructional procedure and create a classroom culture that is consistent, coherent, and continuous. And I'm going to explain that further later. And of course, an effective teacher trains students to take responsibility of whatever uh, they're doing or behavior and even um, their duties as student in uh, completing their assignment. So that is uh, the core of this uh, episode for this afternoon, center on how to become an effective teacher and be successful in behavior management. So Harry Wong says discipline is behavior management, not a classroom management. So we need to understand that those two are separate, okay? So discipline deals with behavior management and not classroom management. Because you always have a misconception like when there are misbehavior students or misbehaving students in your class, people do say, oh, he has a poor classroom management or the teacher has a poor classroom management. Those are two entirely different things. Behavior management and classroom management are two separate things, okay? So, what is the difference? So classroom management is organizing the, the classroom so that student learning and achievement can be accomplished. So when you say classroom management, uh, the teacher knows uh, what is the beginning of uh, you know, the day. Are you going to start with the bell work? Are you going to have a procedure for uh, washing hands first so that everybody starts fresh and clean? Are you going to have the students go to the restroom before you even start your uh, lesson so that uh, no one will uh, raise their hand to go to the restroom in the middle of your lesson? So those are some of the classroom management skills. And um, organizing the classroom in such a way that it, it includes also the space management so that kids, uh, they are comfortable in, in their space and uh, people that don't belong or sit together, you need to know where to put them, things like that. So that is a classroom management. How about the behavior management? So managing behavior, so students will act in a proper civil and responsible manner. So this one is focusing on the student behavior and uh, action while classroom management is more on strategy of the teacher, how to make the classroom runs smoothly. So that is the difference between classroom and behavior management. 
So the first part of uh, dealing with behavior problem or uh, solving behavior problem in your students is to understand behavior issues. You need to know that behavior is caused by something. A misbehavior is caused by something. Even if it is a positive behavior or a negative behavior, there must be a cause under, underlying with that behavior. And discipline is learned. So even though there's a behavior problem, if you train them to be disciplined, then that can be learned. And misbehavior can be caused, but what happens in the classroom, especially if you are a teacher in the classroom, and by what teachers do and do not do. So that is a very uh, interesting topic um, to talk about, by what teachers do and not do, okay? So when we say behavior is caused, we have to um, analyze or understand why a certain student is misbehaving. Like for example, Jenny is always, you know, uh, running around, is always screaming, is always bothering other kids. Maybe Jenny has some medical issues that we don't know. So we need to understand those. You need to know the medical reasons why uh, Jenny is behaving as such. Maybe Johnny was diagnosed with a hyperactivity disorder or maybe with anxiety disorder and all those. So there must be some reasons why Johnny is acting as such. And if it is not a medical reason, it can be a home conditions. You know, Johnny might have a problem at home. Maybe he did not get a good sleep last night because there was a problem in their household or maybe he missed dinner, that is really very sad. But those are some of the home conditions that is uh, causing the behavior problem. And Johnny is trying to tell everyone that I am not okay. That's why he is misbehaving. And um, students, children are not very good in articulating their emotions. Sometimes they let it out by acting out. So we need to analyze those. We need to be very sensitive and try to do a little uh, investigation what's happening behind. Because uh, those behavior problems doesn't just happen just like that. There must be a real reason. And it can be also a social emotional. That's what, like what I mentioned, it can be an anxiety. It can be, uh, you know, um, they might have a bipolar disorder or um, things like that social emotional issues or they're undergoing some uh, hormonal changes that can happen as well, especially the middle school students. They are in the transition period that even then they don't understand what's happening with themselves. So that is part of the social emotional. That's why they need uh, kids like this. They need um, counseling. They need to process their emotions. So they need help with counselors. It can be also an external factors. What are those external factors? One reason is maybe Johnny was bullied in the playground and no one saw it and no one corrected it. So he's now like mad and angry. So he must be being bullied, you know, outside. So things like that, we need to investigate. And unmet needs, like what I have mentioned, maybe Johnny did not eat dinner or he's you know hungry or maybe johnny is is um doesn't have a book or doesn't have uh, any school supplies that's why he doesn't want to do his work he's just trying to camouflage so those are the underlying condition why there is a behavior problem and sometimes um kids that have special needs they also behave because of their condition. Like what I have mentioned, if, if the student is diagnosed with a hyperactivity disorder, then um, it, it's part of, of their sensory. They cannot, uh, they need to do something to express those sensory, uh, sensory needs or sensory uh, issues. So those are the students with special needs. So as a teacher, when you see that the student is behaving differently or causing behavior problem or acting differently, 
we need to find out the reason. And, and these are some of the reasons, okay? And then after knowing those reasons, of course, the next topic is you need to create a, like a behavior modification in uh, dealing with those. Uh, but that's another different topic, okay? And um, like in medicine, they say prevention is better than cure. It's the same thing in, in the class, in the classroom. Prevention is better than intervention, you know? When you observe that uh, there is a, a problem, you need to act on it already. You need to deal with it, okay? So you need to uh, analyze whether your classroom management is okay. Is there a coherency? Is there a continuity or a consistency? What do I mean by that? So if you uh, put up some rules or you are implementing rules in your classroom, let's say you say, uh, okay, uh, before we start the class, everyone must drink water and use the restroom so that uh, when we start our lesson, we can uh, do it continuously without uh, interruption. So you need to be consistent with that. Let's say if Peter raised uh, his hand and say, uh, teacher, may I use the restroom? You have to say no. If you say yes, or you may go, then you are not consistent with your rule. So it means like if you set a rule, you need to implement it. You need to be coherent, consistent, and you need to be uh, continue. There is a continuity. Like if, if there is a rule that you set, wherever you are, even if you are, let's say in the, in the multipurpose hall and uh, one of your students did not follow the rule, then you need to deal with it, okay? So wherever they are, they need to know that they need to behave. There, there should be consistency anywhere with the uh, rules and following rules. And with regard to discipline in the classroom, there, there must be a compliance. So you have to make your students comply. If you set a rule, they need to comply. And in, in, in such a way that uh, with that compliance and rules, complying with the rules, you have control with their behavior. I'm, I'm not saying it in a bad way, like you need to make them as a robot. It means like, Children needs to know how to regulate their actions as well. And rules is um, the one that controls those actions. And when you say coercion, it means you need to force it. If, if it is a good rule or if it is a good procedure, you cannot just, you know, uh, take it for granted. If uh, you have 15 students and uh, 14 of them are following the rules, and one is not, you don't just take that one student for granted. You need to force it. You need to make him understand that it is a rule. So that is like, uh, there is a control and coercion. And, and that leads to consistency also and coherency. So you need to remember those. So manage behavior using rules and consequences. We know what rules are. Rules are what students are expected to follow. That's why at the beginning of uh, every school year, teachers are very excited to develop their classroom rules. And in some classroom, teachers work with the students in developing their classroom rules. Because I, as I have mentioned before in, in my previous episode, like when you involve the students in developing rules, there is a high uh, success for that because they will own it. They are the one who develop those rules. So rules are what students um, need to follow. And of course, what will happen if they follow and don't follow? So there is a consequences or there is a consequence. There is what we call negative and positive consequences. Negative consequences is what happens to students if rules are broken. And then some of these are like, uh, you can withdraw some of their privilege. Like, you know, um, let's say they have 
free time uh, 10 minutes before the, the bell rings uh, at the end of your period, then you can withdraw that privilege. That those are negative consequences. Or you can uh, write a letter to their parents saying uh, what um, unexpected or unwanted behavior they did in the classroom. So it, it means uh, that that's not a good thing for a student, you know, sending a, a bad note to the parents. So that is a negative consequences. Or sometimes uh, in, in some uh, schools, what they're doing is if a student is a member of a, let's say a sports team, then they cannot play for one week or they cannot join their team because of those uh, consequences or misbehavior, okay? So th that, those are the negative consequences. You are withdrawing privilege that, um, that is not uh, welcoming to the student so that they will learn their lesson. But what are positive consequences? These are what students receive for appropriate behavior. When I say receive, it does not mean like we always give material things to uh, students, you know. Uh, most research found that when you are giving um, material reward, or they call it the extrinsic motivation, it's not always um, like successful. It is just a short-lived effect. Like if you give them, let's say, uh, Okay, if you get a high score today, I'll give you a sticker. And then sometimes after you do that, students are no longer satisfied with stickers. They will ask for more. They will ask for more expensive things and they will ask for different things. So sometimes material things are not good, positive uh, consequences or positive rewards. So what can we do then? Rewards are positive consequences and some of this rewards can be positive comments, you know, just saying or uh, making a shout out that Johnny did a good job in, in the poster making contest. So that, that is uh, already a positive uh, consequence of giving a positive comment or acknowledging their success. And sending positive note to their parents it's like the opposite of the other one, sending a note that tells a negative behavior. But this one, you send a note with, uh, the, to the parent for something good that Johnny did, okay? And display their work, you know, the good work. Put them in your display board that gives them a positive reward. And sometimes teacher does uh, like breakfast with teacher or lunch with teacher, Kids are very proud to sit down and have lunch and breakfast with their teachers. So that is like a prize for them. You can do that. It doesn't cost anything. And uh, make a student like your teacher assistant for the day, you know, like a leader for the day. So those are some of the positive consequences or positive rewards. It doesn't have to be always material things. And how do we set the rules? So we have like what they call the general and the specific rules. These are, these are both good, but depending on the group of your students. Like if you have more advanced or mature student or in the higher grade level, you can develop some general rules. Like example of general rules are you can say, be punctual, be respectful, keep the room clean. So those are like general rules and uh, more uh, mature or older students uh, can already comprehend that it compasses a lot, it's general. What if you are handling little ones or some of your students are with special needs, you know, you need to be very specific with your rules. Instead of saying be punctual, you can say be in class when the bell rings or be in class when you hear the first bell. So that is very specific, okay? Instead of saying be punctual, what is that, okay? How, how do you quantify the punctuality? And um, instead of saying be respectful, you can say keep your hands, feet or objects to yourself and use kind words. So those are very specific. 
And instead of saying keep the room clean, you can also say uh, specifically pick up trash and throw in the bin. So th those are some of the rules that will help you manage behavior. Be very specific uh, with some group of students, okay? And, and there are two types of classrooms, the effective classroom and the ineffective classroom. So uh, what do you mean by that? Ineffective classroom is uh, when the energy of the teacher is used to stop misbehavior. You know, sometimes teachers cannot uh, teach anymore because all they did is to manage behavior or stop behavior problem. So that is an ineffective, ineffective classroom. Your behavior is exhausted by stopping. I mean, your energy is exhausted by stopping misbehaving students. What do you need to do instead? Create an effective classroom wherein an energy is used to enhance learning, okay? And uh, in order for you to do that, you need to follow um, the tips that I gave you. You need to create uh, rules in your classroom. You need to understand your students' behavior. You need to be consistent, coherent, and con there is continuity. And you need to uh, provide consequences, whether it's a positive or a negative behavior. So there is a negative and positive consequences also, okay? So create an effective classroom. And just uh, one last word from C.M. Charles. He said, the trend in education is to move from punitive to supportive cooperative approach. So before, if you remember in the olden days, uh, there is always punishment. There's always like even corporal punishment. But now that is no longer the trend in education. Instead of being punitive as a teacher, we need to be supportive and cooperative. We need to understand where our students are coming from. We need to know their needs. We need to know their interests. We need to know their learning style. And uh, we need to develop a cooperation in the classroom. And when I say cooperative, it means, you know, um, teaching is not just uh, the role of the teacher. It is uh, the stakeholders that includes, you know, parents, principals, uh, administrators, counselors, therapists, and all that. There must be a cooperation among the team in order to uh, educate a student or develop a, a whole rounded student, okay? So those are some of my tips regarding behavior management. I hope you learn from this topic and uh, as I've mentioned to you, if uh, you have some requests on topic, just message me and uh, let me know so I can uh, present that in my next episode. So if, you, if this is your first time watching my video, please don't forget to subscribe and, uh, so that you get notifications. So thank you for watching and to God be the glory. So bye for now. See you on my next episode.